Good day. Welcome to Ask Canada Immigration Lawyer, Evelyn Aka Podcast. It's a very long name, but we do it for social media purposes. Um, I am honored to have today my friend and colleague, Diane Butler, joining us um, from Washington State. Diane is a partner at um, Davis Wright Tremaine. Welcome, Diane. Hi, Evelyn. Thanks so much for inviting me. Oh, I'm so excited to have you. I'm going to give a quick bio about you so people know how awesome you are and that you are our go-to and we call you whenever we have U.S. immigration questions. Um, so Diane Butler helps clients successfully navigate the immigration process by providing concise guidance each step of the way. Diane's practice is focused on employment-based immigration law for small to large companies, including investors and startups, to established multinational companies. She also handles I-9s, H-1Bs, H-2A compliance reviews and audits, investigations and litigation, so the whole spectrum. Diane partners with in-house legal counsel, human resources personnel, and recruiters in securing foreign talent and problem solving to achieve business objectives. I really am excited to have you here. Welcome, Diane. And Diane is a partner as well at the Seattle office of Davis Wright Tremaine LLP. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much. So today we're going to focus on um, so many changes that are coming up with immigration. And so one of the first things I'd love to ask you is about um, entrepreneurs and startups. And as I read your bio, you, it's referencing the fact that you do this type of work. Can you fill us in a little bit on what options are available to in the U.S. for entrepreneurs and startups, Dan? Sure, be happy to do so. We tend to think of startups as those smaller companies who want to ramp up quickly and get things moving, and maybe entrepreneurs as more of the individual. There are several questions we always think about whenever we're presented with an immigration issue, and in particular for the startup and entrepreneurial world. Mm -hmm. So first of all, who is the individual who is going to be employed? There needs to be some employment. And what is their academic background and their work history? Mm -hmm. What is the job? What role are they going to fill? Are they going to be an executive, a manager, somebody with uh, specialized knowledge? And is it going to be, uh, where's the money going to come from? So is the money going to come from the individual entrepreneur, from angel investors, from an entity outside the United States? Those are really important considerations mm -hmm. in this context. And then who's going to be in control of the work of the individual? Are they going to be in control of themselves? Or is there going to need to be for the particular immigration category some element of control by the employing entity. And then also a key consideration is what is the compensation going to be? In some instances, there will be a prevailing wage requirement that is established by the U.S. Department of Labor. Most of, in the immigration world, most things are controlled by U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services, or perhaps the State Department or Department of Homeland Security. Mm -hmm. But the Department of Labor has great concern about what the wage and compensation structure is. Yeah. And then sense. finally, yeah. yes, yeah. what is what's the time frame in mind? What's what's the ideal? I mean, even if somebody wants to have a green card or, as they say, become a U.S. citizen, then they might need to be willing to take a kind of a measured approach and just come in temporarily uh, as a visitor or, or a business traveler in order to get things going and mm -hmm. then be willing to have a temporary status of where uh, and hold off on those dreams of becoming a U.S. permanent resident or citizen. Wow. So, so just so I'm clear, in the U.S., like say somebody, you know, does want to come as an entrepreneur, do they ever just arrive and get that status right away? Or do they have to do the process of temporary to longer term? That's a really good question. And I, I do want to point out that the U.S. does not have a startup visa per se. Some okay. countries do. U.S. doesn't Yeah, we do in Canada. Visa. That's why Canada I was does. wondering. Yeah. So there's nothing yeah. that they can come no. in as a permanent no. resident, okay, wow. Right, yeah, generally no. Okay. But, um, but, and I want to point out, there is something that is called an international entrepreneur parole. 
IEP. And this has been in place for since the Obama administration, mm. but it doesn't really work very well. <laughs> okay. <laughs> not, yeah. And not used very much because it requires, well, it requires a 10% ownership, generally at the minimum 10% by the individual entrepreneur. And, uh, and then they have to be involved in something that's going to have a significant benef public benefit to the United States. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of odd that that is deemed to require one of a couple of things to show that somebody else has kind of vetted them. For example, yeah. one would be investment of at least $250,000 from a qualified U.S. investor. And there's a definition for that, as you might imagine. Of course, yeah. Or a government award or grant of $100,000. So I did want to put that out there that we have something that some folks think of mm -hmm. as a startup visa, but but it's not. it's not. Generally, what's needed is to uh, to look for an established entity mm -hmm. in order to be a sponsor for employment. Okay. However, there may be some ways for an individual to create that sort of entity. Mm -hmm. But most often, those who are entrepreneurs or interested in startup, will come into the United States on a temporary basis for an exploratory visit under the business visitor category. And then and how do they move from that? This is That's the key. I'm really trying to mm -hmm. figure out that bridge. How do they move yeah. from B1, business visitor, mm -hmm. yeah. to something else that allows them to work? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it kind of depends on what is going to be the best immigration category fit for them. Mm -hmm. And in the U.S. immigration world, we have this alphabet soup of all the different various categories. You've mentioned the one, yeah. uh, the, the B, B1 for business visitor or visitor for pleasure. Um, when we think about startups, entrepreneurs, and investors, kind of the first thought tends to be what we call the E1, E2, mm -hmm. investor visa, treaty investor, or treaty trader. And we'll talk mostly, I think, about the E2 investor visa. And this is uh, something that is really a common, uh, common concept for Canadians because the E2 investor visa is available where there's a bilateral investment treaty between the U.S. and Canada, and uh, NAFTA or USMCA counts as that treaty. Mm -hmm. And there is investment coming from that country into the United States, either from an individual or from an entity that is deemed to be a citizen of that country, Canada. And the individual is, uh, let's say, bringing the money in yeah. to invest and control it and get things started up. So now, in, in, in order to answer your question, how do you get from that business visitor to an E2. The general way of doing that is to go through the embassy or consulate outside the United States because mm -hmm. this is treaty-based, State Department has control of it. And so there needs to generally be the consular in involvement in reviewing to make sure everything is satisfied. Mm -hmm. And the individual could be either an executive or manager or essential employee of that entity in the United States. So yeah. there does, for all of these categories we're discussing, there does need to be an entity established in the United States. Okay. Somebody's coming cool. into the United States on a B-1 as a business visitor. They are permitted to go ahead and set up a U.S. company. They just can't work and take a salary. Can't work and, exactly. They've got, yeah, yeah. Until they've got some other. Yeah. Our office yeah. helps with like E1s and then we usually bring in people, you know, like yourself to help us if we have any E2s um, for that cross-border piece. Sometimes they don't qualify for an L1, for instance, right? Or NAFTA L1, I would say. But what do you do in terms of what is the US EB5 visa? For entrepreneurs and investors, what has happened with that? Because we obviously don't touch any of that. I don't know anything about it. Yeah, that's a really, really good segue because we were just now talking about the E2 investor visa, which is a temporary category. Mm -hmm. You can get your visa for up to five years and then stay for up to two years at a time with renewals. But many people think about the 
EB-5 investor visa, which is a green card mm -hmm. investor visa. And so the requirements, the basic requirements are pretty straightforward. You need to invest a specified amount of money either in establishing your own company, in which case you would need to invest a million, used to be a million dollars in March, it was raised to a million, a uh, million fifty thousand. And <laughs> then you would need to set up your company and have a, a good, strong business plan to employ at least, uh, to create at least 10 new jobs. So mm -hmm. it's a job creation visa. There is also a lower amount, not that much lower. It used to be 500,000. Now it's 800,000. Mm -hmm. If you are going to invest in what's called an EB-5 regional center, either in a targeted underemployment area uh, where there's at least 40%, uh, uh, I can't remember. I forget the percentage, it changed recently, yeah, yeah. but, or in a rural area. Yeah. So now this, again, the rules for this changed recently as well. Mm -hmm. It used to, before March, there were established these regional centers, which were supposed to be in targeted employment areas that ended up in places like Manhattan. <laughs> so... <laughs> There was there have been a lot, a lot of invest, uh, a lot of in, uh, EB five investments in major metropolitan areas. Yeah. Um, but uh, but that's kind of been taken off the table, and now it has to be an uh, area of underemployment or a rural area. So you're going to start seeing a lot of rural, as we call it, EB five regional centers established, which really should have some economic benefit to the United States. The other thing about the EB-5 regional centers, in addition to the lower in required investment amount, is that you don't have to show you directly employed 10 or uh, created 10 new jobs, but it can be indirect. A smaller so amount, constri yeah. yeah, construction costs could, yeah. uh, for, the, for getting things started up, could count. That's so um, interesting, Dan, because British Columbia has a program that's similar. It's the Regional Entrepreneur Program. So mm -hmm. similar to, whereas if it's in the greater Vancouver region, um, just across the border uh, from you, the, you need to invest more. And then out in the regions, you can come in and try to keep a, a, a region employed, hire one or two people, and it's a lower investment. So it seems like the U.S. and Canada are both focused on those underserved communities Mm -hmm. As opposed to everybody who immigrates wants to go to the, the centers, right? The big cities. Right. And so right. we're all trying to spread them out a little bit. I think that's a great idea for sure. Yes. Wow. Yeah. Okay. We're still sort of seeing how those changes are going to be playing out. The EB-5 program was extremely stalled for quite a long period of time, mm -hmm. which kind of doesn't make sense when you want to get that money to work right away yeah. in the U.S. Yeah. But things should start to, should be kickstarted right now with the uh, recent changes to the program. How long would a pro would that process take? I mean, obviously with COVID, both of our practices have been impacted by <laughs> the slowness of the consulates and the embassies, but what is a normal processing time, let's say for an EB-5 visa? Oh gosh, it's so hard to say what normal is. I mm -hmm. filed a case back in 2014 that was, uh, and there are multi multiple steps to the process mm -hmm. where the first phase was approved in about, uh, a month. Mm -hmm. And I have one now. This is these are both Canadians. Oh, uh, wow. <laughs> one now that where the first phase of the process has been pending since 2018. Oh my God. And that's the first phase of the process. And then you need to once we get that first phase approved, then you can file for your green card and then you need to there are conditions mm -hmm. which you need to apply to have your the conditions lifted which means that the the entity and the project still need to be on their on the track to success which yeah. can be outside of your control when they're particularly when there are pooled investments for a particular project so it's hard to say right now maybe we'll have a better sense in a year or so from now, the one that has been pending for uh, so long, I re I learned that there was um, a site visit, which sometimes we think, oh, no, not a site visit investigation. Mm -hmm. But in this case, we're happy to have a site visit because it means that the immigration service 
feels that they are ready to move to the next phase and mm -hmm. we might start seeing some movement in the EB5 area. Wow. So let's talk, let's switch now, Dan, to the whole H1B process. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just, I know you do work for people from all over the world to the US, but let's kind of focus on, let's say, Western European countries, because we know everything takes longer or, or Canadians to the US. What are you seeing in terms of the H-1B process? Is it still, you know, I explained to people the kind of the, the nature of the lottery, but I'm interested to see how long it's taking an average employer to get selected. Do you, is there any kind of rhyme or reason? Sure, sure. It's becoming a little bit predictable once we get beyond the unpredictability of the lottery. Mm -hmm. And just for a little bit of background, the H-1B category is one of our go-to's for many types of employers, including startups and mm -hmm. possibly entrepreneurs, well, we can talk about that. So the H-1B is available where there is a U.S. employer that has a job where they need someone who has at least a bachelor's degree in a specialty occupation. Mm -hmm. And that can be a bachelor's degree from the United States or equivalent from outside the United States. Yeah. The, there is a quota and it's fairly low for the United States. It's 85,000 new H-1Bs per year. And there oh. is a very high demand for the H-1B category because it just makes such sense and works so well. Last year, there were about 250,000 <laughs> uh, applications, like mini applications for this category. Mm -hmm. Because there is such a high demand for this limited quota, the Immigration Service has established a lottery. And the way the lottery works is that in the beginning of March, the employer who is interested in an H-1B for a prospective employee will do a registration with just really a bare little bit of information mm -hmm. about, uh, about the, the individual. And and there is a a, a win the window for submitting the registrations is open around March 10th to March 25th, a couple of weeks, very short period of time. So the registrations are submitted, and then the Immigration Service does the lottery on these registrations and will notify the employer by the end of March mm -hmm. who is selected in the lottery then the employer will prepare the H-1B petition. The quota becomes available the first of our fiscal year, which is October 1st. And you can file six months in advance, which is why this we have this opening uh, in, in March. So mm -hmm. then those that are selected in the lottery, we prepare the petitions on paper <laughs> and mail them off to the immigration service for the adjudication for an October 1st start date. So that's kind of the that's kind of the typical process for the H1B. Mm -hmm. Many times the individual already is in the United States, I think probably the vast majority because they may have graduated from a US university and we can do a change of status for them within the United States. So in that case, the timing, back to your original question, the timing would be let's say employer has an interest in a potential employee, we're already building our list right now yeah. for those, but they might contact us maybe in January, February, right at the beginning of March. And then we would do the registration, they get selected, file the petition. And then if they are in the United States and we've done a change of status, they can start work right away in the H-1B category if it's approved mm -hmm. on October 1st. So, so, I mean, I guess the challenge is, I mean, employers have to be planning so far ahead, right. you know, let's say that they are coming from India and, you know, and they're not already in the U.S. Mm -hmm. um, how long do you think, I mean, is, have you ever had a case where in two or three years they've not been selected? Like how long are they going to wait for a potential employee? Yes, we've had some, you know, when they, we keep trying to give them a bite at the apple year after year after year, and they just never are selected. <laughs> yeah. It's unbelievable. Um, yeah. Unbelievable. It's, I would say, I guess maybe surprisingly, there are a few okay. of the clients that I've worked with who just haven't never. been selected. Yeah. But on average, I mean, I know you can't give any guarantees. But what I'm trying to figure out is 
how long would an employer, you know, if you're lucky to be selected, great. But if you're a student and you've finished school and maybe you finished OPT, been working, and you don't get selected, then what? Well, we are going straight to green card for some students. Oh. And I don't know, maybe this is a good time to also talk about the option of uh, working after graduation in student status yeah. as an entrepreneur or first oh. round. Fabulous. And that, yes, that's quite viable. So the way that works is that uh, foreign students are designated with F1 status. Mm -hmm. And after they graduate, they are eligible for 12 months of optional practical training, OPT, mm -hmm. when they get an employment authorization document, an EAD card. And so long as they are working in a job that's related to their degree, there are very few hurdles for the employer. And so it can be a startup entity. In fact, it also could be the individual's own company. The student's uh, own company? Yes. Wow. Yeah, that actually is a possibility. Hmm. And one thing that makes it easier than an H-1B is that the H-1B has a prevailing wage requirement. You have to pay what, again, as we discussed, what the Department of Labor thinks is the prevailing wage. For the student in OPT status, there is not a requirement for a minimum prevailing wage. That's so interesting. One other, yes. And one other interesting aspect about the F-1 OPT is that if the individual has a STEM degree, science, technology, engineering, or math, then they are eligible for an additional 24 months OPT extension. So, That's you know, great. many times, yeah, so when those employers are hiring those students, they might bring them on board while they've got the first 12 months, try to get them in the H-1B lottery. If it doesn't work the first time and they've got a STEM degree, mm -hmm. then they've got at least one more bite at the apple. Mm. That is just so interesting how there's so many moving parts with U.S. immigration, and it is right. truly an alphabet soup. Um, That's right. I find yeah. it really interesting. Like, we've had people coming from the States, as you know, the H-1B green card thing is just unbelievably long. I had mm -hmm. a consult yesterday with um, an Indian citizen who's in the H-1B and he basically said, I'm a forever H-1B. And that's how he described <laughs> himself. And I'd never heard that, but he basically yeah. was like, I will never get green mm -hmm. card at this point. Mm -hmm. And so he's looking to Canada. Mm -hmm. How is mm -hmm. it that the U.S. government can let these fabulously educated, skilled professionals in, but doesn't allow them to move to green card in any reasonable time frame. Can you explain that? Because in Canada, as you know, you can become a Canadian permanent resident in two years, three years. Right. Like it just yes. doesn't make sense to me. Yeah. You know, I think it has to do with U.S. employers being very in, ingenious and innovative. And we do have enough categories that we often can find solutions to tide somebody over. Mm -hmm. And for example, we can, like I said, start a green card process for somebody who just graduated. Uh, the green card process in the United States doesn't require the person ever to have even stepped foot in the yeah. U.S. So there is that possibility, but most are here. Mm -hmm. And the, the typical way to move to a green card for uh, under employment sponsorship is that the employer must lay out what the job requirements are and job duties, including the minimum education and experience. And it must be only the minimum, not tailored to the individual. And then do a labor market test, which I think I know is different from your labor market test, but to show that there are no qualified, willing and available US workers and to obtain a prevailing wage determination from the Department of Labor. Once all of that is satisfied, this process is called PERM. Mm -hmm. And once the Department of Labor approves the PERM process, then the employer moves on to what is the petition for their, as we call it, the alien worker, the non-US citizen worker through the immigration service to show that the Department of Labor agreed that they couldn't find any qualified, willing, and available U.S. workers, 
and now the employer has identified this individual to fill that role. Mm -hmm. Now this can, it can work for startups, but one thing to think about is that at that second phase, the immigration service phase, the employer needs to establish that they have the ability to pay the prevailing wage that the Department of Labor deemed was the wage um, going forward and from the time that they file the petition. So if you're a brand new startup, then you might not be, you might not be, uh, you might still be getting money from investors and yeah. there might be a challenge showing that you have and will continue to have the ability to pay uh, as deemed by the Immigration Service and Department of Labor. So and it's, how long yeah. does this normally take? Like, you know, assuming everything goes, is there any kind of sense of timing for this whole green card process? It depends on what country you're from. And that's not because the U.S. has specific country by country quotas, but there is an overall employment quota for immigrant visas per year, and no country can use more than 7%. So like, you're, like the individual who is a forever H-1B, mm -hmm. this is what's going on with that person. The, the uh, India and China use up a lot of the quotas, primarily because of the demand for tech skills yes. in the U.S., and so when one country has used up their 7%, then they end up uh, backlogged. Yeah. There is this third phase of the process where the individual will be moving on to actually apply for the green card. If they're in the United States, they would do what we call adjustment of status from mm -hmm. something like H-1B to permanent resident status. And you can't even you can't even start that third phase of the process if there's any backlog. So... The Ind uh, India is uh, quite backlogged oh, because of the of the quota. So um, now we didn't mention we didn't talk about this, but the H one B has a six year maximum. Um, however, if you have the phase two of the green card process approved, then you can extend beyond the six years. So okay. I think the longest one that I had was. Uh, an Indian client in H-1B status for 14 years before oh she got a green card. It's just unbelievable. It's like we want to keep these people. So clearly that's why I'm always saying, come to Canada, come to yes. Canada. Because I find it just, um, it's just really difficult from a family perspective and all of that stability. And I know that you do your best work and you know professionals like yourself, but it's like, we can never give a sense of real timing what do you say to your clients when they say how long is this going to take like <laughs> you know and they all want to know how long it's going to take and right. what do you say right. well I would say to that extent we have benefited immigration lawyers have benefited from the well-known inefficiencies of the immigration service and the U.S. government, mm -hmm. so that when we tell them we don't know, they don't challenge us as to why we don't know, and we give the best range estimates that we can. Mm -hmm. We can say, and typically what we do is we say, based on current processing times, yeah. and based on your country of birth, this is what we project for you. And then we say, you know, but please don't worry, because we have a plan to keep you living and working in the United States, having the ability to travel while we're waiting. Okay. So that is what is generally most important. The, the yeah. employers yeah. who are in the process, employees who are in the process tend to be quite patient. Some have given up. Yeah. But, yeah. <laughs> it's so brutal. It's so brutal. Um, yeah. I mean, you know, I think obviously we know politics plays a part in immigration and both sides of the border. And during COVID, how do you think your how has your practice impacted during COVID? Like, was there any real change in the types of applications that were being processed or that obviously the the, the extensive delays? Was there any other wow. change? Yes. Well, during the prior administration, we saw over a thousand changes to immigration processing rules and regulations. So it was like batter up every day. Mm -hmm. What's coming at me today? Mm -hmm. During COVID, 
the main change I would say that we experienced had to do with individuals who had who were outside the United States, who got stuck outside the United States, mm -hmm. needed to depart, needed to come in for the first time. And there, the situation, as I described it, was that nothing was happened unless there was an emergency. Yeah, We yeah. did have a period of time when there was a national interest exception where we could get an individual into a consulate or embassy for their visa appointment, provided we could show some national interest, again, as defined by the government. That was the biggest change, I would say, that we saw. Yeah, and the backlog continues. Are you finding that, you know, applications are still behind? Like, we just applied for a simple B1, B2 recently for a... Um, a permanent resident, a UK citizen. And it's interesting because he's been coming back and forth under the, you know, the, the visa waiver program for UK citizens. To, and then one time, you know, I didn't know this and then he was stopped. And now, and the appointment date is like eight months away <laughs> from Toronto, mm -hmm. you know? And so the client is like, this corporate client is like, what is this? And so now we're probably going to move them to the UK because he is a UK citizen uh -huh. where it's faster. But are you still seeing these kinds of appointment delays? We are seeing some improvements. I attended a roundtable with State Department officials a little while ago, mm -hmm. and they expressed their dedication to trying to alleviate the backlogs. In fact, many immigration lawyers had been discussing trying to send clients to third country locations outside mm -hmm. of their own country and wondering about whether the consulate office consular officers would welcome them or send them back to their own country mm -hmm. at the state department round table they specifically mentioned that it is perfectly fine to send for an individual to go anywhere in the world for a visa appointment. In fact, they rather welcome it as a way to alleviate the backlogs. So even so, if they're not resident there or they don't have citizenship there, they can go any place? Correct. That's really different. That's very correct. different. In Canada, you have to be a resident of mm. the jurisdiction or a citizen. You can't just oh. choose your port. That's mm -hmm. really cool. That's yeah. a good thing to know. Okay. Yes. Well, of course, Many clients yeah, yeah. really want to go to Canada for their visa appointments, but um, it's, it's not so easy. It hasn't been so easy this year to get appointments in Canada. Yeah. Um, I still can't figure it out because Canadians don't need visas. So <laughs> it's all the other people. <laughs> it's all the other people coming up from the U.S. Right. I don't know what it is either. It's all the permanent residents. Um, yeah. So let's transition then, Dan, into talking about remote working and immigration mm -hmm. implications. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I've done a podcast before on digital nomads because we don't have one. And we just starting to look at the fact that since COVID, people are realizing they can work from anywhere. So a lot of people are traveling and working remotely from wherever they want. Um, but Canada and the U.S. don't really have a digital nomad visa. So how do you think this is in fact impacting our ability to grow our economies or attract immigrants if we don't have that kind of visa, the remote working one? It's, it's limited. And in the United States, under our immigration system, there are additional limitations too. For example, the H-1B category that we've been discussing, mm -hmm. the employee cannot move from one metropolitan statistical area to another, much less another state without first filing an H-1B amendment to show that the prevailing wage is being paid. And so that is one limitation. There also are, as I heard on your podcast about digital, digital nomads, considerations regarding tax withholding, possibly workers' compensation, labor employment, oh. systems that need to be paid into considerations about restrictions on terminations, whether there needs to be notice given or other elements to consider. Mm -hmm. And we also are facing a pretty big change in employment laws in the United States. In many local state jurisdictions, there are laws for pay transparency rules. 
whenever a job is advertised in these locations, these jurisdictions that have implemented these rules, the employer must post the wage they are offering mm. or possibly a range. So this is a very, very new development this year, but it is on a rolling start and going to spread across the United States which, with very little consistency among jurisdictions. Each one has their own nuance as to how that plays out. Why so, do you think they're doing this? Why do you think we need to have pay transparency from this process? Hmm. Well, I suppose many would say that in part it is for diversity issues mm -hmm. okay. to make sure that uh, diverse populations are on notice as to what the offered wage is. Okay. It may yeah. also be to prompt employers to be fair in their wage payments and attract individuals mm -hmm who are going to be well-suited for the position and also to, well, provide tra transparency and not having one wage in mind and then offering a lower wage yeah. when they ask, how yeah. much would you accept for this job? <laughs> I understand that. Oh my goodness. Um, so, I mean, isn't there the LOMB visa, for instance, where they, you have to say where you're gonna be working? What have you been seeing with that? Like since COVID, how did that play out? If people were working from home, were there any need to change anything from an immigration perspective or was it just accepted that people were not gonna necessarily be working at the place you indicated on your L1B visa application? The enforcement mechanism there would be an in-person in uh, audit or mm -hmm. investigation. We haven't been seeing that occurring as much over the past year or so since mm -hmm. COVID. You know, it's uh, COVID of course really put a, a hamper on that, but it we haven't seen the immigration service taking the position that it's a different location that should have been disclosed if they're, if they're working from home. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, that's good to know. Um, right. When we bring people from Canada to the US, they love L1s obviously because NAFTA L1s because the spouse can work. Mm -hmm. And and this is always the challenge. Like in Canada, any skilled worker who's here, the spouse can work. It's not always this, the case with US uh, visas. So the L1 is one, but the TNs, they cannot work, right? Correct, correct. So what are you seeing in terms of that? Um, you know, are you seeing what, what did the spouse need to do to be able to qualify or to be able to get their own employment authorization document? That's one really, really good change from last year. There are a few categories where due to a lawsuit, the when the individual enters the United States or receives their uh, approval from the immigration service, mm -hmm. they are now given the, a designation with an S on the end. So L2 is the L is the intercompany spouse category. Yep. And then the S will be added to the end, which means that that is all the individual needs to present in order to be eligible to work. Also, the E2 investor visas now is in that same situation. Right. The spouse will have the S on the end. They present that they used to have to separately apply for an EAD. Mm -hmm. And that would take half a year or more. <laughs> so this was quite um, a positive development. Have you seen it actually, have you seen it working? I mean, I remember when this new, when this lawsuit um, was determined and the change was made where you could get your designation as a spouse to work, they weren't actually doing them at the airports for a while, at least mm -hmm. in Canada. Have you seen them doing that? It's almost, it's almost the default now. Okay, good. Yes. I'm glad mm -hmm. to hear that. So they no longer need to apply for employment authorization documents anymore. That Correct. L2 with an S is all they need because it shows they're dependent. But TDs don't get that. You know, dependents of TMs right. holders. So yes. what do they do? They have to find their own category to fit into to in right. order to work. Oh yes, yeah. generally. Generally, that's what we do. So yeah, difficult. if possible. Or they just have to be aware yeah. when they are getting the the TN status that the spouse will not be able to work. 
Yeah, we, we tell them, but I mean, people think it's okay. And then when the economic situation has changed and look how tough things have been lately for everybody, people are wanting to work and have dual incomes. It becomes more of a priority. Um, is it right. possible? I know I've called you on this before, but I think it's really important to move somebody from a TN, let's say it's a TN engineer, to an H-1B, to a green card, because at the end of the day, they all say they don't want to stay long-term. And then all of a sudden, oh, I love it here. I want to stay. And we always tell them the TN is a non-immigrant visa. So how mm -hmm. are they making that arc? And is it really realistic? Oh, yeah. And I, I love the TN category. You know, sometimes when we, when we were talking about people being um, shut out of the lottery, the H-1B lottery, mm -hmm. then we do send them to Canada, send them to you so you can help them find <laughs> a job there. And then when they get Canadian citizenship, then they can come back mm -hmm. on the NAFTA status, uh, uh, SMCA status. Yeah. Um, so getting from TN to permanent residency, I usually don't build in uh, an interim H-1B because it is possible to do it without that step. So mm -hmm. you're, you're absolutely right that uh, the H-1Bs can have what's called dual intent. They can have, have the temporary job with the ultimate intent of becoming a permanent resident. TNs are not allowed to have that dual intent. They can only have the temporary intent at the time. So really, mm -hmm. it's a matter of figuring out what time frame are we looking at here? And from an immigration perspective, it's the time frame and the intent when the individual enters the United States or signs anything to the immigration service. So when they enter in TN status, so long as they understand that right now you have status for up to three years, at this particular time, you might have uh, thoughts about maybe in the future becoming a permanent resident, but it always has to be so long as there's some ambiguity and not mm -hmm. a definiteness, like I'm never leaving the United States again, <laughs> then, then it is possible okay. to make that transition. And it is also possible because, because Canada is such a great country and anybody in TN status, if they should lose their job in the United States, would most likely have the opportunity to go back home to Canada and exactly. live and work there. Exactly. So well, and the other thing, yeah, the yeah. other way it works is that or the reason it works is because the sponsorship is, as we think of it, owned by the employer. So those first two phases that we talked about, the recruitment, filing the immigrant petition, those are represent the employer's intent. They do not represent the individual's intent mm -hmm. until we get to the third phase of the process. So if the employer has driven the process all the way along, then we can somehow, we can generally time it so that the individual TN worker has enough time left to get them to the point of filing for adjustment of status and then converting to a green card. Okay. Wow. So much going on. I think immigration yeah. is never boring. Never. Have you been seeing um, anything in terms of remote work? Like any problems does, you know, does your firm, Davis Wright Tremaine, do they advise on, because it's almost like an overlap between employment law mm -hmm. and immigration law. So right. what kind of questions are you seeing around remote work and immigrants or immigration categories for your people? Yeah, yeah. Well, Evelyn, I think you and I should start a separate business, <laughs> which would be just to compile all the rules from all the states and provinces. Oh my God. <laughs> um, because the, the considerations are, they are the jurisdiction specific considerations. Okay. Some employers will not allow employees to move to a certain state because the rules are a bit too onerous for mm -hmm. them to comply with. But one primary consideration, and I, employers tend to like this, is that they absolutely can impose a rule that the individual cannot move to another state relocate without prior permission from yeah. the employer and it can be a can uh, it can be a basis for termination if they make a move and don't and don't notify the employer in advance okay no that's very yeah. helpful that's very helpful and we were just talking before we started about all the layoffs that have been happening from oh, all yes. these high-tech companies from meta right. to everybody so right 
tell me about that. I mean, they, they must have a lot of foreign workers as well as American right. citizen employees. What is the impact of being laid off from, from Twitter, you know, from some of these yeah. large social media companies? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there, there are timing considerations. So my understanding is that Twitter has given about a 60 day notice and there are U.S. rules about giving certain amount of notice before a layoff becomes effective. I'm not certain whether those who have been notified have been relieved of their duties and have an effective date in the future. But let's say somebody is in H-1B status, which mm. would be valid until September 30th next year. So if their termination actually becomes effective, let's say January 1st of 2023, yeah. then the H-1B rules also allow for up to a 60 day grace period. It's a shorter of 60 days or the end of your H-1B status. Okay. So that individual could have that period of time to try and find a new employer. And the H-1B rules have fairly liberal provisions for what we call an H-1B transfer. transfer yeah. Right, yeah. So if the employ if there's a new employer who wants to sponsor somebody who already has an H-1B, that H-1B worker can begin working as soon as the new employer's H-1B petition is filed. They don't have to wait for the approval. So that's what many H-1B workers who are facing the layoffs will mm -hmm. probably be doing. So what about, let's say if they're an L-1 and they've come from another country where they're working for the related entity and they get laid off, what happens then? Because they're not in H-1B status. Right. And it's based Much on being better. working for the pre the, the related entity. What happens to them? Much more challenging because the L1 is is tied to the relationship with the US entity and the entity outside the United States. They and there is no L1 transfer option as there is with an H1B. So it might be possible to get into an H1B status, but there again they'd be looking at the lottery. Yeah. And uh, if they're Canadians, they might be able to get into a TN mm -hmm. if their occupation is on the TN list. That's a pretty good option. Uh, a green card process could be started, but it will not be far enough along to be of benefit without them having to depart the United States. They might go back to school. Mm -hmm. We've got this, I have this whole checklist of things I go through for <laughs> what are the options? <laughs> Can the spouse work, you know, can the spouse get a TN or an H1B or a different L1 or an yeah. E2? Yeah. Sometimes, you know, they might be able to find like a Canadian might be able to find a Canadian headquartered company that mm -hmm. could sponsor them for an E2. And if they're in the United States, then they don't have to just to get into They can get into this E2 treaty investor status by a change of status without having to depart the United States. That's great. Uh, eventually no. they'll need a, they'll need to go home and get a visa from the consulate, mm -hmm. but there may be kind of a little quick fix to enable them to remain. So oh, we just goodness. have to do a case by case analysis and figure out what the options are based on those, you know, five questions that I <laughs> mentioned yeah. at the beginning. Oh my goodness, Diane, you are such a source of information and that's why I call you all the time and email you because <laughs> there's so many moving parts and you know, obviously are. you have a passion for this. You've been doing yes. this for decades um, mm -hmm. and you are one of the leaders and you're also involved with AILA, which is mm -hmm. wonderful, the American Immigration Lawyers Association. I would like to thank you so much for joining my podcast and letting me pick your brain and talk about all these interesting developments. Um, if anybody would like to reach Diane Butler, you can find her at Davis Wright Tremaine in Seattle, and she is a partner there and is leading the immigration practice. And, uh, and I hope that this will lead to people reaching out to you because you clearly do know your stuff. And I just want to thank you again for all your support over the years and for participating in this podcast. Oh, thank you, Evelyn. It's always a pleasure to connect and collaborate with you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, bye-bye. Okay, bye.